we are here. We're live. It is a Thursday afternoon. Episode two, Start, Scale and Grow, a podcast about technology businesses and the challenges around the people side of things. Here with my friend and probably yours if you're watching or listening, Mitch King. Mitch, lovely to have you here. Thank you. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me, Simon. Can't complain at the moment. I'm rested. Uh, what's the term? Fun employed. Fun unemployed. <laughs> how do you say it? Fun employed. So yeah, I've been having a good break. Yeah, I was going to say, how is it? How is it being jobless? <clears throat> you know, I, if there was uh, money coming in, I, I'd love it. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> you know, at some point uh, I will need to work again. But the, you know, was it January nineteen? Australia is usually pretty sleepy, so I, I don't feel like I'm missing out on on much. Just starting to get into the interview cycle as a, as a candidate nice um, but that's no, been been good it's been a long time since i've had a break so i i've probably left it too long yeah and, and i think the crux of what you and i are going to talk about hiring in a fast growth environment and all the the challenges that come with that easy sounds fun sounds easy but i think people underestimate how much it drains you mentally and and, and physically and i know Caitlin sure. and our team uh, after doing something similar with Explore, it took some four or five months off because she was just absolutely burnt out after, I think it was like three years, pretty much with no breaks. Um, yeah, yeah. So something you'd know a lot about. So again, just for, for listeners and viewers, you know, this podcast is about the people side of growing a business. So start, scale, grow. All businesses need three things to, to, to be successful, right? They need capital, they need market fit, and they need people there's no mm-hmm. podcast about the first two we're really interested in talking about the people side of growing sure. technology businesses how that works how that happens and for those heathens that might not know of you and might not know your background <laughs> do you want to just give us a bit of a, a quick sort of two minutes around your background and what you've been doing recently sure the background i've been in recruitment in digital creative for Oh, it's going to make me sound old, Simon, but 14, 15 years um, now. Most <laughs> most recently, uh, I was at Linktree. I joined there in the early stages, bootstrap, 18 people, first sort of TA people hire. And there was just a lot of things that happened at that time. I started when COVID started, yep. so all remote. And then other companies were making layoffs, we started hiring all over Australia. Series A, Link, Linktree had phenomenal product market fit. They, when I started, I think they had about ten thousand customer sign ups, account sign ups per day. Wow! Within a few months, we were over the sort of twenty, twenty five, thirty thousand sign ups uh, per day. So that Series A triggered a fair bit of hiring. Um, Series B came pretty soon after because you know the the trajectory that we had, we they had created that category. They were dominating that category. So, you know, rightly so, investors were like, grow it while the strike while the iron's hot. So that that TA team and, and that company within two years went from 20 to 300 and that TA team from just me to about 12 from memory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then... Like everyone, there's a bit of a market slowdown uh, start of last year, midway, well, first quarter or two of last year, uh, and had that sort of, you know, slow off change of, of market. Um, and then I finished up with them in December, um, just before the, yeah, just before Christmas. Gotcha. Cool. So been through really early stage, first TA hire, a few people in the business to this rapid hiring globally because it wasn't just... Australia, or, or yeah, guys were here. Fair, fair bit in the US. Um, we ended up with five to ten in New Zealand, and then there was dotted highs in other regions: Brazil, Indonesia, India, couple in Europe, but Australia, and then US were, were the primary focus. Yeah, yeah. So let, let's have a have a chat, chat about that because from the outside looking in, that can seem really exciting, and I'm sure there are parts of it that, that, that absolutely were. But when a business first starts up and there's only one TA person, there's not a lot of what we'd call hiring maturity, like thinking around the process of, of how you're going to, to grow these people 
Um, mm. and, and that's not you know, finger pointing any founders because people who haven't been in hiring roles themselves don't understand necessarily the complexities, the workload, the volume of activity that has to go into generating one hire, let alone a few hundred. Yeah. How, how do you start trying to position things and grow things properly from the get-go when the expectations that highs are just going to turn up and, and, and things are going to happen? <clears throat> yeah, I'd say from that, from that experience, I, I couldn't say this would be applicable to everyone in every sort of set of circumstances. I came in and looked at the, I guess, what the business was asking for, what the needs were, and felt like because of that volume, because of the resources available, I don't, I don't want to say we cut out those processes, and but the, the documentation, the time it was going to take to lay out a process, get everyone on board, build that hiring maturity, it didn't feel like we had the time, the luxury for that. So the attitude I had was we'll do all of this as we go. Because that hiring maturity was, you know, really low because it, it was such a small company that had grown so fast, they hadn't at that stage had people in leadership positions. Say, for example, you look at engineering, there wasn't a CTO at, at that point. So it was a case of trying to educate as we went. And, you know, there's a thousand different reasons you might need to educate people on and feedback, quality feedback, speeds, or rejection reasons, all that sort of thing. Um, but it was to it was very action orientated. So I needed to get the right people, the right candidates into the business, get those interviews happening. There wasn't... I didn't believe there wasn't a real appetite to do a lot of strategic and theoretical learning and then go on to that, you know, bums on seats um, activity. So, yeah, I went very, let, let's get the people in and, and let's figure it out as we go. Yeah. And I guess, I guess the, you know, we, we, we sort of call that, you know, you, you build the plane as you're flying it, a pretty common expression. But, but I, yeah. I guess with that approach, you have to be really comfortable with, you know, despite best intentions, hey, some hires aren't going to work out, but we'll learn from them and we move on and mm -hmm. we take out from, from those learnings what we can and apply them to the next ones. But how how do you how do you sort of then prioritize um, as you're going the the areas that you really want to you know tighten up on? So if you're if you're seeing hey, you know, you brand new CTO and he's got to, he's got to build a new team, you're then hiring your next layer of managers. For him, or you're you hiring engineers first. How did you sort of split that up with, with him? To be honest, the the actual headcount planning and what we were hiring, where they were going, I don't think we ever slowed down enough to put that into stone and polish it. The the numbers that I talk about and the velocity of that growth, <clears throat> you know, when you're in that environment, it's very easy to look at things in hindsight and say, well, at that point we should have done X, Y, and Z. But when you're looking at, the, let's say, those growth numbers from a user standpoint, it's 10,000 today, next week it's 15,000, you don't know what the, the truth is yet. Yeah. Is, this, is this surging because of COVID? You know, that was a, I don't know if anyone's remembered or they've just blocked it out, but that was a very strange time, particularly in Melbourne, you know, that, that extreme lockdown and borders were closed. And so do you build a company structure around what's currently happening or is this a short-term thing and then we'll adjust? And, you know, some of the <clears throat> the research that VCs, when they invest, they do their research, that they make a lot of graphs. They were growing at a, a pace like SaaS companies in terms of top five, I think it was, globally. You know, that surge that Zoom and Figma went through at that time, we were in the same conversation. So... That, that's sort of one of the, maybe the lessons I learn from it is as, as much as you have that want and, and need to keep up with that growth, you may be better served. The efficiency is probably going to be better if you stop for a day, a week, whatever you can realistically afford um, and just put that plan in place. But ours was... Um, in terms of what we were hiring, it was very much 
as we went, we'd sort of figure it out. You know, there'd be there'd be some days, weeks where you get instructions for, okay, we've got this in place, now we need 10 of these. Um, so it was never a what I would call a robust, mature, detailed plan of attack that we went on. Everything just, it was just a blur. Yeah, a blur. So just thinking so then about some, some of the detail, you know, were, were, you, were you at a point where you were, you know, maybe spending time with engineering leadership, understanding the, the engineering culture that they're trying to build and how you communicate that so you're, you're able to attract, you know, the, the quality of engineers that you're looking for? So when you're having initial conversations with, you know, great senior engineers that are already employed and you're trying to take them out of jobs that they're in, you know, how do you convey, apart from the excitement of, hey, we're building this thing and we're figuring it out as we go and there's loads of autonomy, which we know some engineers really like. But then when you're talking about things like engineering culture, what would they think could die? Yeah. In I, as in my standpoint on this and uh, always be my attitude, I think, is the more transparent you are, the more likely you're going to get the right fit. Both, and that goes both ways. So when... And this changed during each stage of the, the growth. In the really early days when we were really small and bootstrapped, it was a little bit easier to explain to people, like, we've got eight engineers, we don't currently have a CTO, so you, you'll want to want to be part of that growth, of establishing what that engineering culture is, rather than there's a defined engineering culture and process, read this document, do you want to be sort of part of that? So the people that were attracted to it, the attraction was they would get to have their say in what we were building. As we got bigger, that, that of course, changed. And, and then but there's different iterations. Series A it w- was one. I think it was really around Series B because I think from memory that first raise in that round was about 45 mil. And it just shifted the perception in market of, what the product was, who we were, how serious to take us. Uh, a lot of people at the start were, it was really common for me to get questions or responses to headhunting like, aren't you just a LinkedIn Instagram tool? So as they sort of more, they saw who invested, that sort of number, their attitudes did shift. There's a lot more questions, you know, around it. And then by that point, I think we had our CTO on, on board and they'd worked at places that, had that publicly available, you know, engineering mantra, if you want to call it that. So it's, you'd almost need to, I'd almost need to go back and timeline everything to say, well, on this date, we spoke about it like this. And on this date, and then this person came in, and then we had this model, um, this structure. So it just, I don't feel like there's one answer to how that worked. And as the TA10 grew, then it wasn't, just me having those conversations with engineers. I've stepped away from the engineering because of the, the volume, but that that conversation would have been very similar just by other people. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's interesting you, you sort of mentioned there, you know, early days, you know, hey, there's a team of eight. Again, I think it's just that, that reminder that for some, for some people, startups are really exciting for all the things we just spoke about, you know, autonomy, be a part of something, maybe get some stock. But for the, for other people, you know, joining a team of eight of a business doesn't have a CTO and not sure if it's going to work out. For some people, that's terrifying. So I think it's yeah. I think like it's not for everyone. Startup life isn't for everyone. You've got to be really comfortable with with a bit of uncertainty. Yeah, definitely. I think some of the questions I would ask candidates to, to understand, particularly when they were coming from non startup backgrounds, there's a there's a bias that if you've worked in startup before, you know, you're very comfortable with it. I don't buy into that all startups are the same. Yeah. You know, the stages, the structures, the the people, they're all different. But when you ask people from non-startup backgrounds why they were interested in startups, they would often say a lot of things, what you just said. Autonomy, a lot of them were frustrated by in the bigger companies, it was so slow to get anything to happen. Yeah. But when you'd ask them, what did they? What were their expectations around the negatives of coming into a startup? A lot of them hadn't thought about that. There was this perception that 
not that everything was rosy, but it was just way more fun and, and easy. But, yeah, some people really unsuited. You could tell sometimes by questions like, uh, I remember a few people would go through the interview and they say, okay, what's the um, what's a five-year career development plan for this role? It's like I, I couldn't tell you the five-week future of this company. <laughs> the, the fact I don't think you're really understanding what this environment is, how much it might shift and, and change. So I, I was always trying my best to not sugarcoat that. Yeah, yeah. And you, you can almost, it's never an exact science, but some people, no matter how hard you push that to them, would retain their excitement. Others, you could almost feel, and sometimes we did have them withdraw themselves, because like, you know, I actually, I am very routine driven. I do like structure. I do like, we needed people who wanted to do things like documentation, but they needed to be comfortable going into an empty room with nothing there and writing that documentation. There'd, there'd be no history or time or resources for anyone to have that prior. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think the more you sort of communicate that upfront and early, uh, whether it's an interview, whether it's in comms, job ads, that sort of thing. But as we got bigger, you know, when we got to that, say, 300 people and other investments, people were making assumptions about what we were. They'd look on LinkedIn and say, okay, you have 300 people. Crunchbase tells me you've had 150 mil investment. So they'd form this opinion or this idea in their head that we were Canva. You know, I remember being shocked the first time a candidate referred to us as a big tech company on an interview. And like three months ago, we were half this size. There has been no time to put those systems, those processes, that maturity in place. And I want to make sure you understand that because that's not what you'd potentially be coming into. This is just a bigger, scrappier rocket ship than it was six months ago, yeah. but it's still scrappy. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, how people convince themselves sometimes that a business is one thing. I remember hiring at Zendesk, um, and Zendesk then had been running for for seven years, and I remember our thing was we're as old as the iPhone. And and you'd have you'd be interviewing people, and you'd, you'd ask them, you know, why did you apply, or why did you respond to my message? And um, and they'd say some of them would say things like, you know, I, I love startup world. You know, mm. and you'd sort of give them a funny look. Well, we're not a startup. We, we're as old as the iPhone. We're seven years old. You know, we we we're, we're, we're yeah. publicly listed. Yeah. So I think people confuse this. You know, this being a big tech company with being a startup at times. And it's- yes. I asked someone yesterday what the, I don't know if there is a an agreed definition on when you stop being a startup, yeah. what that. Yeah. I think we even joked about it sometimes at, at Linktree. Um, people would say, like, are we allowed to call ourselves startup now? Like, we're, how is it how long the business has been around for? Is it a certain size, a certain investment, certain profitability? But, yeah, I remember having people refer to zero as a startup and but I don't know their exact history, but I know that they weren't, you know, startup-y. But, yeah, that confusion between startup and tech and that acknowledgement of whether if you're really junior in coming in, knowing that the person above you hasn't had a chance to set foundations up, you know, to mentor, to train you yet, can you almost support them in that journey? Or being really senior and coming in going, you don't have anyone junior yet to offload other tasks onto. So you'll be doing strategy, you'll be doing planning, you'll be people managing. But for an engineer, for example, you'll still be writing code. And that's where it, maybe the, the fun isn't always as fun as it seems for everyone else. Yeah. Yeah, there's a romanticism attached to startups, isn't there? Mm. Yeah, it was really tough the first few months. Yeah, we were sleeping under the table. You know, all this sort of thing. Like that. That's that, there's nothing fun about that. Like it, it's hot. yeah, yeah. It's, it's grind. It's it's crappy. Yeah, and the the equity sort of um, pool that you touched on, and you know, you read one story of an engineer who 10x their shares, and you know, you you'll probably know the statistics, but it's probably less than less than 1%, maybe less than half percent that actually um, exit, exit, you know, profitably. And, um, yeah, and some people, the sort of the bigger we got, they were almost obsessed, you know, with getting into that sort of place. But it's – I'm not sure if 
some people would ever really be suited to it. Even as founders, it's maybe sometimes I think we're a little little dumb for continuing to, to, you know, to want to go back into it. But for most of my career, I've been in that sort of environment where it wasn't highly structured or robust and I, I like it, but it's not for everyone. But, but again, from, a, from a, a talent attraction perspective, you know, this, this thing of, you know, there is an excitement about the place we're creating our own category. Um, there isn't a lot of, pro, a lot of process or documentation, but, but you get to, to define and help define that yourself. For some people, that's a real pull and, and, and mm. that's super exciting. When, when you look back, what, what, what things surprise you that, that, that sort of went better than you, you could have expected? I mean, look, you're, you're, you're pretty prolific on, on, on LinkedIn and you sort of got, a, got a, a, a way about you there, which I'm sure sort of helped um, attract people in the brand itself probably. Mm. Uh, after uh, as momentum started happening, the brand itself probably attracted people. Yeah, obviously spoken to some of your, your founders in the past, Anthony and, and those guys, and you know they they seem you know really good to work with. But but what 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 in hindsight was surprising about that? that went really well. <clears throat> it's in hindsight the. Well, I mean, when I first started there, I I didn't expect it to go to 300 people and you know and and have that level of of growth i was already using the product so i I knew of it but the the pull of being an australian startup that was having that much growth and investment i think maybe that surprised me and it didn't even maybe i didn't even realize it until later because be in conversations with other companies, other TAs about their struggles to, you know, to hire, particularly engineers. And really at points we had the opposite problem. We, we had a lot of high quality applicants and referrals um, coming to us. So, you know, it's very much a first world problem uh, to, to have, but that sort of, there was a lot of people would say, you know, first one, or not the first one, one of the biggest ones since Canva in terms of that speed of growth and refer to us to those other yeah. unicorns. Yeah. I think one thing, because it was never a factor for me, I, I'm surprised how many people are, or maybe were, maybe things have changed in the last six to 12 months, were attracted to unicorn status. Okay. It would just never be a factor for me. Mm-hmm. It's this, for me, sort of ambiguous nickname for you know, reaching certain marks and yeah. valuations is probably a whole other podcast because mm. what is it really? It's, it's a, I call them guessy guesses. Yeah. But yes, yeah, you get that unicorn status and my goodness, people were coming out of the woodworks from quite big companies now all of a sudden, yeah. like people that had rejected my advances before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, why is that term mm. changed your, your whole mindset? Yeah. Um, I think, and, and do you think now that there are a few people on on LinkedIn who have X Linktree on their on their LinkedIn profiles, do you think this the the, the cachet that comes with this, the the brand that sort of comes with this, is, is interesting? Yeah, it's hard. I hope no one, none of them, get offended because I do take the piss out of people that put X where they're from. I understand the the point. I think it's hard for me to know because I was in there. I was with the the brand, so I. I can't have an unbiased view of what that external view of the the brand is. I would say like since I've been on the job hunts, there has been quite a positive. So far, people interviewing me tend to be quite interested in how we grew that quickly. And it, yeah, so it is almost this like, what's the, the word, the... Rainbow, rainbow tinted glass, rose tinted glasses. That, yeah, that that is a is a, it was a good company, and that helps you. But, but I don't know. I don't know how much these things carry into everyone else. It, I would imagine it definitely has a bigger brand. I, I know even if you look at something like a LinkedIn following metric, you know that grew probably I think from maybe five or ten x, you know, over the last sort of two or three years. So I'd I'd imagine so, but yeah. You'd have to ask others. 
people that didn't work with you, what their view is, you know, of that. But they've the let's call them the alumni. I've gone to. There's a lot of really good. Um, they've gone to really good companies that, that I would say. So, and I don't think anyone really struggled, or the majority definitely didn't struggle to find jobs afterwards. And in that peak, what was the peak of hiring? Twenty. 21, mid-2021, I was going to hit up a lot. <laughs> there was a lot of headhunting going on. Probably everyone, but definitely with them. Yeah. So the brand, obviously, the brand and all the elements that we've spoken about probably helped in attraction and, and, and getting conversations. How, how, do you stay, how do you stay sort of genuine then with all, with all the hype and all that sort of stuff? And you know, how, do you, how do you keep interviewing teams and hiring teams sort of focused on really good quality interviewing and again this ship as you fly it and keeping process yeah i think i'm not sure if and this this may just be the sort of scaling effect like the, the people that we hired in those early stages I, I place a lot of emphasis on trying to you know as much as i can control it get really good people in because as you'll know it's much easier to hire other people when they're interviewing with really good people. Yeah. I'd follow up with candidates and, and there'd be, it'd be really rare to not get really positive feedback on who they were interviewing with. You know, the engineering managers that we brought in, the head of data, so I was like such nice people, really honest. So what we had hired for, they were then selling themselves during those interviews. So I didn't have too many instances, I don't think, where it had to be like we're going to settle for something we're not not sure on or not comfortable with. But yeah, in terms of having like a, a takeaway from that, yeah, it would just be so different in different stages of business in, in where you're at with that speed. In hindsight, if I was going to do it again to be extra protective of that, I would have reduced some of my capacity doing say recruitment and made sure the onboarding for interviewers and their training was more robust in terms of alignment like we all understand what we're looking for what we're not looking for in every job we have here that was always something we were sort of doing conversationally you know rather than like here's a learning program or document yeah yeah agreed and you know, that's, it's again, it could be another whole conversation, but 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 culture, like scaling culture, um, I've always sort of found it really really interesting. You know, you you can have you, you hire your CTO, your CPO, and your your chief data officer, whatever. You have your internally, you have your your, your set of values or your, your culture, whatever you, however you want to call it that. But everyone interprets things differently, right? So your, your CTO could be talking about. A, one of your values slightly differently to to to, uh, to your CPO, yeah. um, and and then you can you can end up having different versions of your culture. And look, I understand as well that you know teams teams do form their own cultures within, um, but getting sort of people aligned to a set of values sort of becomes challenging the quicker and quicker you're growing. What going looking at your role then, that the role that you're into, what what sort of person do you think sort of thrives in that sort of job? What what, what you've got to be really comfortable with? I think you need to be really comfortable with stepping outside, maybe stepping down from what you believe your job description should be. Yeah, so I remember interviewing for certain roles, especially when it was someone to head up a new team or division. So say that the, the first hire in, I'm trying to think what our first hires we made, let's say customer support. In your current role or maybe in a role that you're interviewing elsewhere, you would have... X, Y, and Z in place, X, Y, and Z team members to do these things. Here, it's it's an empty block of land. We need you to draw the plans, pour the, the slab, build the bricks, and then at some point, you're probably going to bring in others to help you finish it. Yeah, so hiring, we did a lot of hiring top down, so bringing those those heads off, um, so being very clear like on understanding that that structure like the growth would probably come six months, 12 months after they started and laid those foundations. <clears throat> so I think that 
could be an ego thing. I think there's some people that I've interviewed and met that, you know, they're head of X and they have, well, at this job, I have a team of 10 and I manage two or three of this. And that's what I do. The very strategy leadership. I think for most of the roles here, you need to be very comfortable being an individual contributor. Maybe that's short term, maybe that's forever. But you will be, maybe the other expression is play a coach. You don't get a lot of pure coaching roles in early stages of, of startups. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what about in, in, in your role specifically? So, yeah, for, for any sort of recruiters out there that are thinking like they want to move into a head of talent at an early stage startup, what, what kind of person do you need to be there? I, <laughs> I, I'm guessing it's kind of the same. If you if you're a head of talent at a corporate and you want to go start up, well, you need to understand that the early part of your life is going to be interviewing. Yeah, yeah. No one, you don't have any sources. Yeah. No coordinating. You you know your interviews for you. Uh, no one's following up. You're putting contracts together. So I think yeah, definitely being very comfortable getting your hands dirty. And I would say depending what their background is, if they've come from that recruitment background with multiple clients or internal <clears throat> when you're an agency side and, and you know a lot of transferable skills particularly in the earlier stages some of the later middle stages less commonly you know used in agency but if you have a client that you don't like you tend to stop working with them if you have a hiring manager you don't like you need to be really prepared to dig in, find mutual ground, and um, they are your clients. You know? So, yeah, but no, I think I think overall that willingness to get the, the sort of hands dirty and prepared to and maybe be honest with yourself in do you need to know, okay, I'm going to work on five roles per month for the next 12 months and fill 60 roles? <clears throat> Or are you going to just fill X amount of roles that the business needs in X amount of time and then your role changes to do sort of X, Y, and Z? That that could be. There was no plan for me to move into leadership and manage a team of that size. It just evolved that way. Um, and the feedback I got was <clears throat> they were, you know, very, I guess, appreciative that I evolved as it needed. And it wasn't sort of saying, well, I need to do X, Y, and Z for my career. It's like I'm very comfortable that I am learning, just learning different things and things I didn't expect to be learning last week. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, again, I think for any recruiters listening, um, there's, there's nothing more terrifying than moving from agency to an internal and your first day of internal going, right, this is where I find out if I know as much as I think of it. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's. I think it very much depends on the type of recruiter that you are. You know, worked with people who were very, and it's depending on your audience. Some people are going to say all recruiters are the same. Um, they're all all snakes and sharks, and they sell their firstborn for a placement. Those recruiters definitely do exist, and they tend to be very good at the the sourcing and the early stage, getting getting the candidates. If you've got recruiters who are in more sort of consultative uh, approaches, maybe they have that uh, retained sort of model. Yeah, being able to that, – that's probably the biggest – not the biggest test. Most of the best advice I could give a recruiter like that is if you're thinking about moving internal, pick the job that you recruit for day in and day out, write – an interview plan for three or four stages for people that aren't you. So after you've screened them, what are you instructing the next person to screen them on? And then next and then next. And if that, if you've said that blankly, then you've, not that you can't do it, but you need some, some training and to, to do some learning there, but it's, it's not all the same. And it also depends on what the business's attitude is to internal talent. <clears throat> some will want that, just give us the CVs and we'll do the rest. So ideally, you'd try to qualify that. What are your expectations of of talent in your organisation? You probably you've probably had podcasts being those discussions that talent getting a seat at the table. 
I believe that's different in every company, every business, every founder, CEO. Everyone has a different attitude of what it is. So it's probably going to be your job to convince them it is what you want it to be. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you're so right. I think we, we have this saying, clarity is kindness, right? Being really, really clear on on mutual understanding and expectations. So, you yeah. Throw away, throw away statements that, that sometimes hiring managers can give you. They just need solid AWS skills. What's your version of solid AWS? Like, what, what are we talking about? Yeah. Give me an example. Or hiring managers say, I know it when I'll see it. Yep, that's great. But I probably need to know it when I see it as well. Otherwise, we're wasting your time interviewing people that aren't going to go anywhere. Yeah, I think that's something I noticed with the more senior or the, let's say the, the better TAs, understand how to get that information out and maybe it's not in that conversation maybe it's later on like hey you said aws here's a person this is why i think they're good what do you think ones that were maybe less experienced or less competent would just say yes okay and then just send aws skills and and not be too sure so that's like anything It, it, it can be taught but (laughs) <laughs> to, to the non-TA people potentially listening, it is it takes two to tango and some attitudes are harder to shift than others. Yeah, yeah, agreed. That's why we always used to love the value of a calibration call or a calibration meeting. You, know, you get your brief, do some sourcing, then go back and do a follow-up, follow-up meeting or a follow-up call with the hiring manager, talk through some profiles. You said X, Y, Z, this is what I'm seeing. Are we on the same wavelength? Are we calibrating our thoughts here? And then that allows you to... Let's just build a relationship. Let's hire managers know that you care as well, I think, yeah, for the most part. Yeah. Yeah, and sort of I, like I think back to those early early days and the, the first people I was working with at Linktree in the um, engineering hiring and the, the struggles they'd had before was either having to just go through applications themselves or having just the wrong uh, – I think the, the classic one was Java developers being put forward for JavaScript, you know, roles. Yay. <laughs> and you know, there's like that. There, there was a reluctance to like, okay, this is what TA is. As soon as you go, like, okay, I understand the very basics of what this tech stack is. So here's five people. The reaction was like, oh my god, the five people, and I want to interview all of them. And that that trust and everything sort of came from that. And those calibration sessions were something that was always like, yeah, this is great to do when we can do it. But oh, I had to sort of adjust it to be an almost real-time calibration screen this person i believe they fit the bill if not i'm going to adjust it from here on but particularly when that market was really high when when that market peaked where you know companies were making offers within a week and you know product designers engineers product managers were getting 10 offers a week you had to adjust your sort of your process there wasn't a time to schedule a a calibration meeting for you or for your hiring managers. So there's a lot of slack, you know, yep. chasing and and I want to say bullying. Bullying's a bad term, but politely asking many times for people to move quickly. Yeah, polite nudging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. For any founders or sort of business leaders that are expecting to go through some growth, what advice what advice would you give them when they're thinking about how they should approach the the people side of things? I think making that plan first, and that that plan probably has a few sort of categories in it. Into what what is the headcount? What is the budget? What is the structure? What is you know what does that look like? And then even though whether it's external pressures, but your VC is telling you hire a hundred people by next month or I don't know what their threats are, but you're you're still going to be better off spending that, as I said, day, week, whatever it is, just making a plan, getting everyone on the same page. And I think that I don't hear people talk about this a lot, but the the resources that it takes for hiring, not not just your TA, but if you had, let's say you were a team of 10 engineers and you needed to hire 40, your CTO or head of engineering should have the autonomy to say, okay, here's four people dedicated to interview and, and hiring, and they only now have 30% of their time to writing code. So 
you don't often hear of, say, the CTO or head of engineering having shared hiring targets. It, it, it sits as a silo with, with TA. And they, you can then sometimes say, okay, well, all right, well, everyone's got a hiring. Hiring's a priority, but nobody adjusts their KPIs or OKRs on the engineering. So you just burn them out and then you've got engineers who don't want to interview because they're going to miss their KPIs and no OK. So that you probably said it alignment and this is what we're looking for. This is how we're going to do it. And this is what's going to happen with the business. So yeah, I think that there's probably too many instances of expecting people to do hundred percent of their day to day job and then be available and really good interviewers at the same time. Yeah. yeah. And in that scenario as well, you know, bring on 40 people. Again, I think uh, I think some people sort of, some organisations just completely miss part of the other the other aspect of that is you've got to onboard 40 people. Mm. Someone's got to order and send laptops for 40 people. You've got to add them to the system. You've got to, you know, set up all their permissions and yeah. what days are they in the office? Like, <clears throat> like how do you, like, it's coordinated. Yeah. It takes time to, to make this. It doesn't just happen like that. Yeah. In some of the... You know, people I've been speaking to and the early stage founders and their issues that they they have a lot of that first piece is really easy to solve in terms of you know, how what's your recruitment process what, what are you saying to the market but the things that happen after that and that onboarding you know is it people don't tend to or companies don't have the luxury of saying all right let's turn this senior engineer into the engineering onboarder so all they do is on board, make sure they're set up, hold their hand for the first month. And if you've got that much hiring going on, yeah. is this a, is a false economy, maybe a false efficiency to to not putting people into those roles and responsibilities and sacrificing their their coding or bud fixing time? But it yeah, whether it's getting them on boarded faster and more efficiently, whether it's reducing your turnover, it it will definitely be a, a big a big factor towards that um, mm. success. I, I agree, and and I've always thought that it's this is, again the hiring peak mid mid twenty one. Everyone was trying to hire senior engineers, right? And then they couldn't, and so they were defaulting to seeing this new category right, emerged: senior mids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if we can't get a senior, we get a senior mid. But I've always thought that there was a role for a senior engineer whose job was to help onboard juniors, so hire juniors. And you put them through a, a month, two months, whatever it is, and the senior engineer is getting them up to speed on mm. this is how we build, this is how we, you know, how we do, you know, code reviews, and 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 helping these these juniors get get contributing as early as possible. Yeah, I thought I always thought it made sense, like easier to hire juniors than than, than seniors for one. Two, I reckon that that's a role that some seniors would love to do. You know, this, like, oh yeah, this yeah. I've seen a couple of companies do that. I think one of them had a title of they're an engineering evangelist, and and that's sort of what they did. And I remember we we hired someone, and that was one of the big selling points. I thought they they brought to us. They really wanted to do that. Now I wasn't in the data of engineering, but I'm not sure if they were ever really given that opportunity because it, there was always that view of we still need more engineers, so we can't sacrifice one to do that. So we need bums on seats to do the coding, but even if you sort of ran that sliding doors, you know, AB tested this in a parallel universe. I think if you spent six months hiring juniors quickly for attitude and culture fit, putting them through internal training, like what they would potentially be able to output in six months versus how many mids or seniors could you hire, bring in on board. It'd be really interesting to run that side by side, but most just want to go with the safety of, you know, they've done it before, so this is a safe hire. They, I think particularly when it's, you know, early stage founders, like they've just sort of started to get money or they've just had investment. And it's the VC's money, it's not their money, you know, so we don't want to, fair enough, don't want to be, take too many risks, but they're quite risk averse when it comes to taking that model that, that there's not a lot of, studies to show that it works it's just a gut feel hypothesis yeah. and and then then we we get to the, the point where where we're at now where 
companies that have taken huge rounds of funding are then having to to rapidly um, you know adjust their adjust their processes. Another interesting case study there, isn't there? Mm. I'm mindful of time. We've been going for five minutes, and you probably talk yeah. about some really good points out of this. Some really interesting stuff, and we'll we'll make sure we flag those. Going back to, to to Linktree, is it true that you had the biggest leaving party in the in Linktree's history? And if so, what embarrassing stories can you share? Not not at all. I, I was, you know, they they flew me down to um, when we went to Sydney, and my most of my team was in Sydney. Um, the people team were there. I'd like to say it was only a small gathering. I, I would say. Uh, if I was Melbourne based, I'm, I'm sure that it would have been bigger. I like to think it would have been bigger. I don't think there's any embarrassing stories that I can remember. I, I'm pretty sure it was like we started at lunchtime. I think I was eating KFC and in bed at like eight o'clock, eight thirty. It's respectable for a man of your age. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it doesn't matter to me where if I start at start at midday. Then eight o'clock, that's long enough. It's the equivalent of starting at nine and going till, you know, 5 a.m., whatever it is. So, no, I'm past those days, past the, uh, the all nighters. Good for you, my friend. Heart- heartburn will get me before anything else does. <laughs> so, you always feel weird putting out your wallet in a bar and a packet of my land to fall out at the same time. Yeah, I probably, honestly, I think in my jacket pocket, I would have had some um, quickies. It snuck up on me, the heartburn came out of nowhere. <laughs> So how do you get past a certain age and no one ever tells you? It's heartburn and your eyebrows growing ridiculously. <laughs> yeah, my it? wife pulled one of those out the day. I think she said it was like growing into my eyelashes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it, it does make you feel really old, but no, they don't teach that in school. They don't say at some random point in your 30s, yeah. it'll feel like you swallowed hot lava half your life. <laughs> this is probably quite a nice segue into... Um, for anyone who's listening who is hiring and interested in talking to you about a uh, yeah. about a role, um, if they yeah. like what they've they've heard, this is like prob- this is possibly like the best way to interview, isn't it? Or, or get yourself out there. Yeah, I don't think you'd have many people that were patient enough to listen to a twenty five minute video interview on every candidate. But yeah, early stage business service and stuff. If those problems that we've discussed ring true, we need someone in that talent. I am based in the Gold Coast, so I am a remote first person these days if anyone's going down that path continuing down that remote path then yeah find me on on linkedin and have a chat beautiful mate thank you so much absolute pleasure as always not a chore thank you, Tom. Uh, Thanks for having me. when are you in melbourne next no idea okay. it depends on the next job all right cool so melbourne companies please hire mitch because we need to buy <laughs> here yeah melbourne and sydney i'm from sydney so and that's a nice that's a real easy flight, Gold Coast to Sydney. So um, I miss Melbourne. I, yeah, would like to go down there just to be able to eat the food every once a month or so. But, yeah, it's much easier to travel when you're up here near the airport. It's and nice and cruisy, yeah. Nice. Well, thank you, my friend. I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. And hopefully uh, people listening, watching, will have appreciated this as well. All the best, my friend, and take care. Thank you. Thanks.